You have a bad case of something called mimetic desire. What's that? If someone with higher status than you wants something, it means it's more likely that you will want it too. You did not have higher status than me. Not then, maybe. I mean, I was smarter than you. Maybe you thought that the woman I had a connection with would make you smarter. You guys ever watch each other have sex? This video is sponsored by Mubi, a curated streaming service showing exceptional films from around the globe. Get a whole month free at Mubi.com slash skip intro. One of my favorite shows from 2021 was The White Lotus, the HBO limited series from Mike White that was so successful that now it's an anthology series. Seriously, the first season won more Emmys than it has episodes. Set on a luxurious Hawaiian resort, The White Lotus took aim at all sorts of isms that regular viewers of my channel will not be surprised I found interesting. The show talked about imperialism. Look, obviously imperialism was bad. Shouldn't kill people, steal their land, and then make them dance. Everybody knows that. Sexism. Yeah, you're making me sound like a trophy wife. But what's so wrong with that? And the general entitlement of rich people. But that's a very nice room. Totally unique. Right? It's really nice. Yeah. But no yeah. plunge pool. So you can bet your butt I was amped for season two. I had my fork out and I was ready to eat the rich. But when I sat down to watch it, I couldn't help but notice that it felt different from the first season. For starters, it takes place in Sicily instead of Hawaii. And while still very beautiful, that removes a lot of the colonial subtext that were essential to the first season's commentary. In Hawaii, the guests were white and served by locals of color, setting the scene for conversations like this one. And now I'm the bad guy. Or at least I shouldn't say anything on account of my inherited traits. I mean, why do I need to prove my anti-racist bona fides? It seems wrong. But in Sicily, there just isn't the same dynamic. Local Italians aren't colonized people of color, despite what The Sopranos might tell you. I'll tell you what it is. It's anti-Italian discrimination. Hey, I'm fucking oppressed over here. That's my, that's my Silvio impression. Wait, is that... Is that anti-Italian racist? Second, while Sicily is still very focused on the 1% and how they're shitty out of touch people, the show has turned its spotlight from class warfare to sexual relationships. Demeter forgave Hades and he raped her daughter. I mean, whatever you've done can't be as bad as that. It's Hades. And the raping. This might sound like a different conversation, but I don't think it actually is. The White Lotus isn't just a satire of rich people or white Americans. It's a satire about power. The way power is wielded, how that power changes us, and why systems of power never seem to change. So, what does The White Lotus have to say? The show just finished its second season, but this video isn't going to spoil the endings of either season. Just gonna kind of provide a lens with which to think about or watch the show. Is that what happens when you're rich for too long, your brain just atrophies? <laughs> I mean, they seem happy. No way. <laughs> it's a front. Let's start by outlining how exactly the show has portrayed the power of wealth so we can come up with a blueprint for how it talks about power in sexual relationships. Like I mentioned earlier, the first season was defined by this kind of upstairs-downstairs dynamic. It's all about money. It's all about the money. The money, money, money. And this was at work all over the first season. Douchebag extraordinaire Shane spent his honeymoon hassling the manager Armand for a room upgrade. And the narcissistic Tanya dangled a business opportunity in front of her masseuse Belinda before predictably leaving her out to dry. Right now, the, the last thing I need in my life is another transactional relationship. You know, it's just, it's not healthy. For me. In season two, this is still very much at play. We see Tanya, again, use her assistant Portia for emotional labor in a pretty dehumanizing way. I told you to stay in the room. I had to eat. Oh my God. But from the moment the guests arrive, season two starts to pivot from money to sex, an intersection that is most exemplified by Lucia and Mia, the women who use the hotel for sex work. È per questo che hanno creato gli alberghi. Che si fanno i soldi sulle spalle di ragazze come noi. 
But that's just the beginning. This connection between power and sex isn't just reserved for sex workers, it's at play all over how the men of season 2 treat and talk about women. In the first season, we saw this primarily through the relationship between newlyweds Shane and Rachel, where he saw her purely as a status symbol to his own life, sexy arm candy with no interior thoughts, needs, or desires. Okay, how about this? Whatever they're paying you, I'll double it. You can get paid to have fun in your honeymoon. With me. In Sicily, the dial labeled horny, creepy men is turned way, way up. Non sono interessata. Succede tutte le mattine. E c'è uno che mi chiede come mi chiamo mentre mi misura le tette. Io per favore vorrei solo bere il mio caffè in pace, posso? Cameron is the second season's closest replacement for Shane, and he is far more sexually predatory. In the first episode, he exposes himself to Harper without her consent, and makes numerous references to his ongoing infidelity with his wife Daphne, before taking her trip to Noto as an opportunity to hit up Lucia and Mia for a good time. Come on, man. You don't recognize a hooker. So innocent, man. But the power dynamic that underlies sex between men and women is even more prominently on display with the DeGrasso family, and the way the three generations of men talk amongst themselves about women. Bert, the grandfather, sees women purely as sexual objects. He's never seen a woman who didn't make him perk up, if you know what I mean. And he's very forward in the way he hits on women. Yeah, you do have more of a northern look. Beautiful hazel eyes. Wonderful smile. You're very kind. You must be very popular. <laughs> All right, Dad. Uh. Dominic, the father, is also a serial cheater, but one who realizes it's destructive to his family. He's just, he just does it anyways. Albie, the son, despises both of their attitudes towards women and has, in some ways, defined himself in opposition to them. I just don't want to be like my dad, you know? I, I refuse to have a bad relationship with women. In the background of these conversations are constant reminders of both the violent implications sex can have and of the parallels it shares with the colonial themes from the first season. Sicily's White Lotus Hotel is filled with Testa de Moro, a traditional Sicilian vase in the shape of a head. As the story goes, a Sicilian girl fell in love with a Moor soldier, but when she found out that he had a wife and children back home, she decapitated him, as one does. So if you put one of those outside of your house, what are you saying? If you come into my house, don't fuck my wife. <laughs> <laughs> it's a warning to husbands, babe. Screw around and you'll end up buried in the garden. Uh -oh. Later in the season, Tanya attends an opera performance of Madame Butterfly, which tells the story of a Japanese woman who kills herself when her husband returns to her with a new American wife. Both are stories that mix the kind of consumption of colonial conquest with sex and have people of color suffering at the hands of their white lovers in both stories. Put a pin in that. We'll circle back to touch base on that again. Just keep it in the backlog for now. As Oscar Wilde famously said, everything in the world is about sex, except sex. Sex is about power. For the traditional men on the show like Cameron, Bert, and Dominic, sex is a thing you take, something that is a symbol of your status as a strong man. Oh, I'm still a man, and I get older and older, but the women I desire remain young. Natural, right? But what happens once you achieve that status, that power, whether it's wealth or sexual dominance? How do you change? Are you satisfied? No, you just run into reality and want to chase more. I feel like you sow your oats when you're young and then you just, you know, you get it out of your system. I don't know. Not sure it works like that. I know, but that's the idea. Well, that's kind of like food, you know? Yeah. Gorge yourself until you're sick. You swear you'll never eat another bite, and then a few days later, you're hungry again. The White Lotus is excellent at poking holes in these status signifiers, showing the collision point between fantasy and reality. Tanya's dream of looking like Monica Vitti on a Vespa runs into reality when bugs continually get in her face. I got a bug! And the hotel manager doesn't recognize her. Guess who I am? Uh... Watch, watch. Peppa Pig. Valentina's savage. Later, when Harper and Daphne travel to Noto, Tanya's myth is dispelled further, in a recreation of this scene from the 1960 film La Ventura. Here, Monica's beauty isn't something you would want to emulate. It's something that puts her squarely in the crosshairs of gawking men. Don't you like being a woman? 
I'm fine with it. Usually. And the show treats every one of its characters this way, undercutting their expectations of who they are and what they think that means they're entitled to. Bert believes he's owed a homecoming by the women of his family, despite never meeting them, and also being generally terrible to the women he does have in his life. Quentin flaunts an extravagant lifestyle to appear as though he has money, while secretly broke and in dire need of a cash infusion. Daphne lives an illusion of a loving marriage with children, but her relationship is filled with infidelity, to the point where she strongly hints that her children don't belong to her husband, but to her trainer. I have this trainer in the city, Lawrence. He's so handsome, he has blonde hair and these like, big blue eyes. Wanna see a pic? This is just a picture of your kids. Is it? Harper and Ethan's relationship, while seeming like the complete opposite of Daphne and Cameron's, is similarly empty. They are intensely trying to create their own myth, to find an opposition to the fake lovey-dovey marriage of their vacation counterparts. It's like, yeah, we fight, we bicker, but that's because we talk about everything, you know? We're honest. They act like they're on their honeymoon, they're all over each other, but it's bogus. It's not real. But this isn't separate from Cameron's kind of mimetic desire. It's just the flip side of the same coin. Instead of taking something she doesn't have in an effort to boost her status, Harper disparages the other, participating in the same zero-sum status game and creating a myth of her own by situating Cameron and Daphne as less than. It's like, I don't know, maybe it's a way of soothing yourself when you feel threatened or something. Harper and Ethan aren't in a real happy marriage either. One of my favorite details of this season has been watching the way Ethan looks at Harper, fearfully trying to read her reaction while also trying to avoid eye contact. Sexual relationships, whether married or not, are inherently delicate balances of power, dances of dominance, submission, and readjustments. I mean, we never really know what goes on in people's minds or what they do, right? You spend every second with somebody. There's still this part that's a mystery. I think you just, you just do whatever you have to do not to feel like a victim. Turns out that you have to constantly rebalance power in sexual relationships if you're ever going to maintain something like love. Usually, you have to pay a therapist for that kind of insight, but here you can get it for just the monthly subscription cost of HBO Max. On The White Lotus, both wealth and sex stand as hierarchical status symbols, always existing in comparison and competition with each other. Something that is even more apparent when compared to the queer relationships on the show, which are always hidden and repressed. Because I gave just so. Drago? È figo, eh? Pure io sono un po' gay. Both managers, Armand and Valentina, are largely closeted. In the first season, Mark is sent spiraling when he discovers his father's hidden homosexuality. You know, if he's having a negative visceral reaction to his father having gay sex, it's valid. It's fine. Well, it comes off as homophobic. And his daughter Olivia hides her crush on her best friend Paula. Queer sex is all over the place in The White Lotus, as a kind of covert currency but it happens behind the scenes, because it has no place in the public systems of social power we've constructed. Do you know these gays? Do you know these gays? While those without power dream of it, those who have it don't exactly find it freeing. Power doesn't provide peace or security, it causes destructive paranoia, a game of constant one-upsmanship that never ends. Everyone knows their life is a sham, but is desperate to maintain the illusion. It's why there are so many disorienting shots of ostentatious wealth. It's why the show's music is so anxiety-inducing. The show's opening credits, as well as the constant cuts to artifacts of antiquity, remind us how much of our world is based on myth-making and illusion. Those ancient Italians weren't sacred, they were just as degenerate as these tourists are. As Madame Butterfly and the Testa de Moro remind us, these power dynamics around sex and wealth and colonialism aren't new. They're near permanent fixtures of human existence. See, I told you we'd circle back. You just gotta trust me sometimes. I think it's the same reason there are so many cuts to nature. It creates a sense that these fucked up power dynamics are almost natural to human society. 
now is as good a time as any to mention that The White Lotus has been criticized for the way it erases people of color. In the first season, the pregnant hotel worker from the pilot is quickly forgotten, and Kai's story was concluded almost entirely off-camera. In the second season, most racial elements have been left largely unaddressed. Harper is half Puerto Rican and Ethan is of Asian descent, but it never really complicates their one percenter status. The racial dynamics of Madame Butterfly and the Tessa de Moro are also left pretty unexamined, except for in this video essay. But I think that this is part of the point that the White Lotus is trying to make, that those with power never have to challenge it or interrogate it. Replacing the old hierarchy with the new one. Like, My feeling is most of these activists, they don't really want to dismantle the systems of economic exploitation, not the ones that benefit them, which are all global, by the way. Even the characters who appear more progressive, like Albie and Olivia, aren't actually substantially different from their parents. She was a neolib and a neocon. I'm sorry, did you say Hillary Clinton? Something about Hillary Clinton? Olivia knows all the words and theories, but she still uses her POC friend Paula controlling her life and seeing her as an accessory to herself. I'm not my parents, Paula. But you are. Actually, you are. You're the one who stole you. I'm the bad guy. Don't give me that. You've stolen too. What did I steal? Well, I guess it's not stealing when you think everything's already yours. In the second season, Albie pushes back on the toxic masculinity of his father and grandfather, most notably when he disagrees with Bert that The Godfather is the greatest movie ever made. Men love The Godfather because they feel emasculated by modern society. It's a fantasy about a time when they could go out and solve all their problems with violence and sleep with every woman and then come home to their wife who doesn't ask them any questions and makes them possible. Hey, hey, hey. It's a normal male fantasy. I mean, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. I think, I think it's a solid movie. But Albie is also a nice guy. He might not be as overt in his desires, but he's doing the same kind of peacocking to try to get with Portia. He uses his anti-toxic masculinity as a source of entitlement himself. Girls always complain that guys aren't nice, but then if they find a nice guy, they're not always interested. And he dotes on Portia even when she makes it pretty clear that she's not all that interested. I feel like I just want to meet someone who's like, you know, totally ignorant of the discourse, you know? Right, right, like, like someone who lives in a cave, like a caveman. Yeah, I, yeah, I would date a caveman at this point. <laughs> I mean, I think he could aim higher. When that relationship fizzles out, he immediately hooks up with Lucia, the same sex worker that his father and Cameron hired. He also doesn't want to pay for her services, but he's not like other boys. He's in love. Yeah, um, I, I don't mind paying. I just, I would feel weird being part of some situation, like, like if you're being exploited. And then when he does pay for them, he thinks that it entitles him to a relationship. On The White Lotus, we have new vocabulary to articulate these power structures, but fundamentally, we're still saying the same things. We can talk about colonialism and patriarchy and white supremacy until we're blue in the face, but that does very little to actually dismantle those systems. And as a YouTuber, I feel both seen and attacked by this. In the process, The White Lotus doesn't just implicate me, it implicates you. You can't tell me that you saw the Hawaiian resort in the first season and didn't immediately want to go there, even if it meant participating in the same colonial dynamic as the guests on the show. Should we give away all our money? Would you like that, Liv? Hmm? Maybe we should just feel shitty about ourselves all the time for the crimes of the past. Wear a hair shirt and not go on vacation. In Sicily, everyone is super duper hot like distractingly attractive. The show knows that you want to think you're different from Bert or Dominic, but it also knows that you're leering at the bodies of Lucia and Daphne and Harper and Cameron and Ethan from behind the safety of your TV screen. I mean, honestly, Michael Imperioli can still get it too. The White Lotus knows its audience. It knows who's watching a prestige drama on HBO, and those are the people it's speaking to. It wants to remind you, you are part of these social systems. You don't stand apart from them. Get over yourself. Most marginalized people are well aware of the systems of power that affect them. You think poor people don't understand that the rich rule the world? You think women aren't aware of misogyny? If you feel like some power structure doesn't involve you, that you're above it, 
you probably just aren't looking hard enough. Power, whether it comes from wealth, gender, or race, is the ability to turn off that criticism and go on living your life. You have trouble sleeping? Mm. I don't know, just everything that's going on <laughs> in the world. What do you mean, what's going on? Very true, the world's a fucked up place, so. <laughs> What's wrong with it? Are you joking? Pretty fucking good world, I'd say. I think that the show is trying to focus on the fact that whenever those with power discuss these issues, the actual people being affected are erased. That the discourse is largely masturbation. It devolves into the same status chasing game, using signifiers to show that we're rich or real men, or woke and progressive. All the while, those power dynamics continue, just like the tide. They exploit me, I exploit you. Crash and burn, Dylan. I think you can read that as very cynical, but it could also be read as forgiving. That these are systems that are way bigger than just us, and that while we should continue to improve, you still have to hold space to understand that you're human. The White Lotus has got to be one of the best shows of the year for me. And I, I guess it's that time of year where we start thinking about lists and stuff. Seriously, as soon as the calendar turns to December, all of a sudden everyone starts pumping out top 10 lists of the year. Like, the, the, But the year isn't even over yet. But I really do like these lists, especially when it comes to movies. I spend a lot of my time watching TV, but I do actually, believe it or not, like movies too. So I look to these lists to see what I miss, what was worth watching, but a lot of times they're filled with movies that are super hard to find. Movies with limited releases, or independent films, or foreign films. Like, uh, Decision to Leave. Decision to Leave is a movie I really want to see. It's a police procedural erotic thriller, excuse me? That's like a combination of so many things I talk about on this channel. It's not playing anywhere near me. But you know what's awesome? Decision to Leave has been released on this video's sponsor, Mubi. Mubi is a curated streaming service dedicated to elevating great cinema from around the globe. Mubi is an awesome way to watch some of the best films from around the world, and everything is hand-selected. It's like your own personal film festival, streaming anytime, anywhere. Seriously, Mubi is the only way I can watch this Korean gem in my area. I didn't even know Decision to Leave was on Mubi until I was perusing the site and came up and I was like, oh my god, I've been wanting to see that movie. And it was the film of the day. These curators know me all too well. You can try Mubi for free for 30 days at Mubi.com slash skip intro. That's M-U-B-I.com slash skip intro for a whole month of great cinema for free. That's right, you can watch Decision to Leave for free right now. That's what I'm going to do. And if you'd like to check out my top TV shows of the year and other fun end of year lists, you can get access to those by subscribing to my Patreon. Over there, I do fun mailbags and give you early access to videos and topics and research and stuff. Only people with the highest social status help creators on Patreon. So, you know, if you want to stay at the White Lotus, you should give me money on Patreon is what I guess I'm saying. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. Like, share, subscribe, ring the bell, pledge your firstborn, and I'll talk at you again next time.